Hello and good morning. My name is Jim Haldeman and I am the Business Development Manager for the Lessman Instrument Company. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Ultrasonic Level Measurement for the Water and Wastewater Applications. Today's presenter is Mark Klee, who has more than 25 years of industrial experience in the oil and gas, water and wastewater, food and beverage, chemical and pulp and paper industries. Mark currently serves as the National Manager for the Technical Consultants Team for Siemens Process Instruments. He is responsible for the pre-sales consultation and engineering for applications and projects. Prior to joining Siemens, Mark was responsible for the distributed control systems and quality control systems for Honeywell Process Solutions. Mark has been Branch Manager for North Coast Electric, a Rockwell automation and electrical distributor. Based in Longview, Washington, Mark holds a BS degree in electronic engineering technology and a degree in mathematics from Central Washington University. We welcome Mark back as our featured speaker and thank him for sharing his time and experience with our customers. With that, Mark, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I can hear you loud and clear. All right. Well, I'm taking it on blind faith that there's actually an audience out there, Jim. So we're, uh, you know, we'll just kind of inch forward. Okay. Well, that's always good. So uh, good morning. Um, probably not afternoon or evening, depending where we're at, but never know how far reaching this can be. Um, as Jim introduced, my name is Mark. I work uh, directly with Siemens Process Instruments. And uh, anybody that's ever uh, known me and uh, even two years ago when I, uh, I uh, presented last year with the Lessman webinar. Uh, everybody knows I always start my meetings with what? Always with a safety minute. So uh, I think I'll do that again this morning if you'll indulge me. So since we're talking about ultrasonic, I thought it would be uh, good to uh, show a picture of a couple guys working on a transducer out in the field. And really the uh, safety minute today is really about having the right tools for the job. Um, obviously these couple guys out here, uh, that's one of our channel partners in, uh, and the uh, apprentice out there working on adjusting a transducer and uh, certainly didn't have the right job or tools to do the job safely. And I find myself in a lot of applications or a lot of places where people try and uh, do shortcuts. And, you know, if, especially if it's safety related, I'm, I'm not afraid to, to declare an all stop here and hold on, let's make sure we have the right tools to do this. Uh, recently, I showed this photo in a, uh, live presentation prior to COVID-19 and one of the participants said, yeah, they don't have the right tools. They're supposed to have two uh, traffic cones out there. But uh, anyway, just uh, take, a, take a moment and uh, you know, pay attention when you're out in the field. Make sure you have the right tools for the job to do the job safely, uh, both from the standpoint of hand tools and also safety tools. Um, today we're going to cover a lot of ground, uh, try and keep this uh, moving forward because in this uh, world of COVID-19, uh, a lot of people are uh, uh, tied to home and uh, certainly over the next 45 minutes or so, if you can uh, stay plugged in, I know it's hard to do and not be distracted with emails and everything else that's going on. Um, I know that's a little tough sometimes, but uh, where we're gonna go is, uh, uh, we're obviously gonna do the safety minute, I'm going to introduce uh, the national consultants team for Siemens. That's a relatively new uh, group within Siemens, kind of talk about what we do. Uh, we'll really talk about a quick view of all of Siemens process instruments, kind of to set some groundwork. Uh, and then specifically today, we're going to talk about level. And uh, there are many, many, many different ways. Uh, oh, level, oh, level, how do I measure thee? Let me count the ways. There, uh, there are many, many different ways that you can count level, and there is one key takeaway. Uh, if you get nothing else out of today, uh, pay attention to that that piece. There's something you'll grab out of that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about radar, because uh, that certainly is a significant part of uh, the level portfolio, but primarily we're going to uh, focus today on ultrasonics. That's uh, uh, what we decided uh, to talk about. Uh, ultrasonics have been around for a long time, but they're still relevant uh, even today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about bits and bytes of how does uh, non-contacting technology really work, what happens behind the scenes. Uh, certainly, uh, even though ultrasonic has been around for a long time, there's lots and lots of stuff that's new. And we'll talk about some of those new, uh, uh, those new features and benefits and uh, bringing us into the 21st century, so to speak. 
there's several special applications specifically uh, some of these are focused more at water and wastewater applications but uh, we'll talk about those and I always like to leave some time at the end for uh, Q&A so as we charge into it uh, about October November this last year Siemens formed a new team uh, nationally called technical consultants and really what this team is this is a team of product and industry specialists and I have the pleasure of uh, being the player coach or manager of that team. And I make my home up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and with the technical consultants, we have them spread out all over, uh, all over the country. Uh, uh, Cole Wiedner uh, over on the far right, he's actually local to the Chicago area. Uh, and uh, have a couple, three folks down in, in Texas and one guy in Atlanta and somebody in Tampa. And so, and certainly we have Philadelphia covered. And, and so we have uh, consultants spread out all over the country. And within my team, we have product experts that are what I call Jedi masters on all 19 of the product, or the product lines that we have within process instruments. So we have specialists within that, but then we also have specialists in particular industries, whether it be chemical or water and wastewater or uh, food and beverage. And uh, certainly we, uh, sp the specialists we can call on as necessary and uh, either from a product or an application standpoint. As we look across just kind of the whole Siemens portfolio, uh, we're gonna focus more or less on that second box from the left on level today. But I did wanna kind of set some framework or groundwork of process instruments really are the eyes and ears of the process. They are, what is feeding up to some control system, uh, whether it be a PLC or a DCS, uh, it can be anybody's control system. It can certainly be a, a Honeywell uh, a PLC or HC900 uh, hybrid controller. Uh, it can be a, a DCS such as a, a Siemens PCS7 or a Honeywell Experion or a, a Delta V system. Uh, our process instruments really will talk to anybody's system. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the advanced communications that have uh, uh, crept into the uh, instrumentation world and kind of how to integrate those things. That always seems to be kind of a hot topic. But just real quickly on the on the far left hand side, all things flow, whether it's a magnetic flow meter or a clamp on uh, non contacting meter or a Coriolis meter for high accuracy or a vortex meter that's primarily primarily used for steam applications. Uh, we do all things flow. We'll come back to level in a few minutes. Right down center there, we do hydrostatic pressure. So whether that be uh, absolute gauge or differential pressure, uh, we uh, do all of that. Certainly within temperature, uh, thermocouples and RTDs, they've been around for decades. Uh, what's really new and interesting with that is not the actual physical element that's making the measurement, but the instrumentation and the head and the communication that's sitting on top of it is really where the step change has happened in the last uh, nine to 12 months or so. We do all things pneumatic valve positioner. Personal instrumentation uh, competitors do is we do all things dynamic and static weighing. So if you want to weigh material in motion, uh, think of a conveyor belt uh, moving rocks or, or rocks or gravel or cement or even anything in the food and beverage industry rice corn beans that type of thing we can actually weigh that material in motion or we do static weighing think of your bathroom scale uh, that would be something that uh, you know you would have either a bin or a, a silo or something and you know, we'll talk about that here in just a moment of course with Siemens we uh, support uh, the parts and pieces that we sell and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, support later on so really kind of coming back to level, uh, there are so many different ways that you can measure, measure level in a tank or a silo. And here's just kind of a representative view. Um, I think you can see my mouse over here, but over on the left-hand side, uh, you have a couple of different point technologies. So you could do a capacitance tip probe or a vibrating fork uh, or another vibrating fork down here at a, for a low, low, something like that. One key takeaway from uh, today is that when anytime you are doing level in a uh, a bin or a silo or a tank, 
uh, solid engineering practices really mandate or dictate that you have some sort of point level uh, backup to that. So we're gonna talk primarily today about continuous level where we're looking at a four to 20 milliamp signal that represents from, oh, in this tank, let's say zero to 15 feet or something like that. But solid engineering practices really mandate that you have some sort of point level backup. Uh, the perfect example of what happens when that doesn't work is uh, if anybody remembers the uh, story of uh, the BP Texas City refinery a number of years ago, uh, there was a level instrument uh, that had failed in the system. Uh, the operators were unaware of that. They thought they were at about 15 feet of level in their tank. Uh, in fact, that tank had been filling all night and at 98 feet of level, uh, the tank overflowed, uh, vented to a blowdown drum and vented to atmosphere. Uh, that atmospheric cloud uh, uh, started to expand from the system. There's a couple of guys sitting there in a diesel pickup truck and uh, they noticed that the diesel truck was running a little bit rough so they went to shut the engine off. Uh, the thing about diesel is uh, there is no ignition system uh, so there were enough hydrocarbons in the air that the engine continued to run, run at, which point, at which point these two operators realized uh, there was a problem, so they jumped out of the truck and, and ran. A few moments later, the truck backfired. The backfire became the ignition source for the vapor cloud, and the ensuing explosion leveled several, uh, 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 oh, what do you call them, uh, uh, like tra office trailers, and killed 12 people. Um, in the root cause analysis of that, one of the root causes of that is there was no point level device to let the operators know that the continuous level device had failed. Uh, it turned out it wasn't a Siemens continuous level device that failed in that process, so of course I can tell that story. But the uh, the real key takeaway from that is anytime that you're doing, even in a solids application over here, we have a rotating paddle switch or we can do vibrating forks, uh, you wanna have some sort of backup to your uh, control system or to your continuous level device. And of course we do have uh, a solution for that as well. Over here on the solid side, since I'm over here, certainly you can use um, a capacitive level or you could use uh, a non-contacting radar. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And certainly kind of hidden down here is the gravimetric or you could uh, put load cells underneath the, uh, under the bin or the silo. And that would work with both liquids or solids. A couple of a uh, couple design uh, criteria that would be a little different for liquids, but uh, certainly you can weigh the bins. When you come back over here to uh, liquids, you could certainly do uh, or excuse me, guided wave radar as a solution. You could again use capacitance, and today we're going to talk primarily about the ultrasonic uh, solutions uh, that are right up here in the upper right-hand corner of the tank. So lots and lots of different ways that you can. Uh, measure level uh, in a tank or a vessel. So really the key takeaway from this is this, there, uh, even though you can measure it in a whole bunch of different ways, usually the application will pick which technology is best for it, not I happen to have this new cool shiny thing and I'm gonna try and shoehorn it in everywhere I want. Uh, certainly keeping commonality of parts in the site is important, usually the, the specifics of that application are going to talk about why you would choose one technology over another. For example, uh, if you have applications where you have a relatively high temperature, higher than the boiling point of water, uh, certainly if you have vapors from your, uh, from your liquids, and certainly if you have vapor stratification where you have different vapor layers, uh, very dusty environments, uh, sometimes with a light density foam, and uh, if you have uh, vacuum or very high pressure or a relatively long range, let's say 50 to 100, 200 feet, those are all applications where radar is uh, usually the best choice. Uh, I'm gonna come back to foam real quick because a lot of people uh, say that radar is the solution for foam. That really is kind of a, a misnomer insofar as that there is no magic bullet for foam. Typically within a level application, foamy type systems are some of the more difficult uh, applications that we run into. 
and you really have to take those on a case-by-case -case basis. It is true, radar does work better in some foam applications, but anybody that tells you that that is the absolute solution for foam, uh, magic bullet, uh, in and out, really is either misinformed or intentionally lying to you because uh, foam can be a little tricky. Uh, it really has to do with the density of the foam and the type of the foam and how does the foam layer change as your process changes. So when you run into those, that's really where you're gonna reach out to uh, Lessman Instruments or myself or uh, the consultants team and we can kind of help you through uh, applications such as that because they can get they can get a little tricky and there's a number of different ways to, to solve foam applications. And, it's really best to look at those on a case-by-case -case basis. So if radar is really good in all of these applications, what about ultrasonics? That really was kind of the where we'll spend the remainder of today. Uh, where would you use those? Well, first and foremost, if accuracy is your primary driver, ultrasonics is the best application to use or the best technology to use. As a general rule, ultrasonics are three to five times more accurate than the equivalent radar. Uh, now, if you have a, a, a lift station, like I'm looking at uh, over there on the right-hand side, and you come up to 10 feet, turn the pump on, go down to two feet, turn the pump off, eh, who cares, right? If you're within a couple inches, uh, plus or minus, uh, that application really doesn't dictate a, a high level of accuracy. Uh, recently, or I guess uh, about a year, a year plus ago, uh, I was over in Southeast Idaho and we had a rectangular weir. It was about six feet wide. And in that particular application, a quarter inch of difference in, or in measurement of the uh, outfall flowing over this weir, a quarter inch of difference made a difference of 250,000 gallons a day, 0.25 MGD, that was either over-reported or under-reported to the state DEQ. So in that case, absolutely uh, 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 accuracy was the key driver because plus or minus a quarter inch uh, made a, a huge difference at, uh, at the reported flow. And so in that application, ultrasonics absolutely was the best technology as we do have an instrument we'll talk about in a little bit that can get down to plus or minus four hundredths of an inch. And so if you're in a lift station, eh, who cares? You don't need that level of accuracy. If you're doing a six foot wide rectangular weir, absolutely, you do need that accuracy. So again, the key takeaway, I'll say it about three or four times today, the application will pick which technology and specifically which instrument, not I have this high accuracy thing and I'm gonna try and shoehorn it in everywhere I want. You know, it might work, it might work uh, pretty well, but really uh, with all of the choices, uh, you know, why pick something that might work? Uh, pick the right tool for the job. Uh, with ultrasonics, you're going to see some uh, things on the installation and setup that uh, make it a whole, whole flick the water off by the action of the uh, of the uh, the speaker, for lack of a better term. Uh, ultrasonic systems tend to be a little faster, so if you have a process that changes relatively quickly, uh, ultrasonic is a good solution there. Um, excuse me, just a second here. Hit the uh, hit the cough switch there. I had a little tickle in my throat. No, it's not COVID-19 related b before anybody in the room jumps up on that. But um, so fast applications. Uh, the other thing is you do have uh, certainly with the Hydrangea series, you do have local control that you can control pumps and uh, alarming or it can be a backup to a PLC or DCS control system such that if the PC, uh, PLC or DCS goes offline or if you lose communication, it can go ahead and take over local control. And then when the PLC system comes back, it can then uh, go back into a secondary or backup role and let the PLC uh, do the control for the pumps. Uh, just in the United States alone, uh, in the Hydrangea product, there are over, uh, there's greater than 300,000 applications in the US. We've been around for a lot of years, have a lot of uh, kind of a proven track record, and uh, they do hold up in that uh, those rough environments. And uh, you know, time and time and experience will tell you that. We'll talk a little bit about sonic intelligence in the next few in the next few slides, and really, what how does that work? And uh, Siemens is a global leader in uh, ultrasonics. Uh, we have a wider portfolio than really anybody in that uh, area. 
and uh, with that, uh, you know, you learn a few things over over 40 years. Um, typically speaking, you're looking at something called an echo profile, and we'll we'll take this apart in a minute. In the ideal in the ideal scenario, you have a transducer; it's going to emit a pulse. That pulse is going to reflect off the material, come back, and your speaker now has turned into a microphone, and it basically listens for the echo pulse. From there, it'll calculate. I've got an echo at some distance, as we're looking at distance in the vertical uh, axis here. Um, that's really kind of the idealized world. In the real world that I live in, uh, you do have obstructions, you have you have ladders and weld seams on the side of tanks, and you have a surface that's not perfectly flat, and so you may not get exactly a perfect echo all of the uh, all of the time. So I think it's important to really kind of talk about what happens when you go out and make a measurement. Now I'm gonna I'm talking specifically here about ultrasonic, but guess what? Radar works exactly the same way. Uh, as uh, we developed radar, as it's a relatively newer technology, uh, ultrasonics has been around for about 40 years. Uh, radar has been around for about half that. But one of the things that you find is our radar has the same engine under the hood. So if you understand our ultrasonics, by default, you really understand our radar as well. And so the way a system's gonna work is, when we look into our tank, the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna send out a pulse and get a return signal. I don't know how well that animation works uh, over the uh, web, but I'll take it on blind faith that it did. Uh, you, know, you did kind of see that pulse moving down. Uh, from there, the system's gonna form an echo profile. This is just kind of a raw profile of what the transducer saw. Then it applies some smarts and some filtering. And we'll talk about the, uh, uh, the spike filter and the narrow echo filter here in just a minute. Then it's going to apply something called the TVT. Uh, the TVT stands for a time varying threshold. And really what that means is, that's this red line over here, that anything that is above that line, or in this case to the right of that line, uh, is considered a valid echo. So in this system, even though before I did have some other things that potentially could have been echoes, the TVT really kind of filters that out and leaves you with, in this case, only one valid echo. Then it's gonna apply something called echo algorithms. We won't go into that today. That's uh, probably a topic for another day and a little deeper than we have uh, in time frame to play with. Then from there, it'll finally select the echo. What's, what's key on this is uh, the instrument will do these seven steps each and every time it makes a measurement. Depending on the instrument and the application, this could be several times a second. Uh, sometimes it's a little slower than that. It really depends on uh, what you're trying to measure and, and the type of uh, system that you have. But it's going to go through these steps each and every time. That really is uh, the key to Siemens uh, level instruments insofar as that that TVT or that time varying threshold is dynamic. In other words, it recalculates and it optimizes that TVT each and every time it makes a measurement. Uh, there are a number of other instruments out there uh, in the world that have something similar to our TVT, but it's a fixed line. It's a fixed signal reference line. And if you have uh, one of those applications in the real world where you have some agitation or dust or, or maybe uh, you know an uneven surface, some uh, something like that. Uh, you don't always have a perfectly clean system that doesn't change. And by having a dynamic TVT, uh, it does give you the ability to uh, track where you believe the process to be and optimize your level measurement based upon uh, the changing process conditions. That really is a key differentiator with uh, the Siemens, both ultrasonic and by the same engine under the hood, our radar instruments as well. Okay. Something else in our technology we developed uh, a number of years ago, which is something called a multi-shot sampling, or uh, there uh, is an application where it will uh, take a number of shots or a number of measurements, and then it applies something for the math geeks in the room, uh, something called a Kalman filter. Um, I think a Kalman algorithm, uh, you can look it up if uh, you wanna Google search what that is, but it's basically a mathematically recursive uh, algorithm that looks at the most recent echo and assigns the highest weight to that and the next most recent echo it assigns a little bit less weight and so on and so on and it may do that up to 20 times and so it will take a number of echoes where you're going to have uh, this 
noise and noise by definition is kind of random and it's looking for the commonalities between the different echoes and guess what using that multi-shot uh, uh, application with the Kalman algorithm or Kalman filter as we call it uh, it helps to isolate exactly what is common in the process which typically is going to be your uh, your process measurement uh, there are also I mentioned a little bit ago about filtering uh, there's a couple different filters. There's a spike filter and a narrow echo filter. Uh, spikes are pretty much very short duration uh, anomalies in the echo profile. Sometimes those may, as opposed to being a little triangle here, they may just be a straight line, just one pixel wide. And the spike filter will take those uh, spikes out. And then there's uh, another thing called a narrow echo filter. Uh, for the folks on the phone that are water and wastewater people, or if you're measuring liquids, you have to be a little careful with the narrow echo filter. Uh, if you turn that filter up too much, you can get a little over aggressive and you could actually uh, uh, either truncate or completely eliminate the very measurement that you're trying to do. So uh, caution to folks that are using the narrow echo filter uh, specifically on liquid applications. The liquid echo or the echo that you get off of a smooth liquid, liquid surface is typically very narrow. And if you get really aggressive with that narrow echo filter, you can actually wind up uh, uh, filtering out your very process. Yeah, not too, uh, too hard to recover from that. Just turn down the gain of the filter and uh, uh, usually things come back pretty nicely. But uh, just kind of a word of caution out there. So when you're looking at looking ahead and what's new, uh, there kind of was a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, you have the uh, original, whoops, you have the original uh, Multi-Ranger Plus, which is kind of the beginning of the, or the current generation, but that uh, reaches back, back to uh, 1987. Uh, Ultrasonics existed before that in the old uh, Air Ranger products, and believe it or not, some of those are still alive and kicking. Uh, I was at a, uh, a site in Arizona uh, about two years ago, they still had transducers that were the old LR21 transducers. I've only seen those in archives and old catalogs. Uh, started asking how long have those transducers been installed? The transducers have been there for 40 years and are still functioning. That's the mechanical or active part of the process and it was still working. Uh, it originally started out as an old Air Ranger system and uh, we were on the third set of electronics upgrades uh, at that point. Uh, with Siemens, we are coming down to one common look and feel across all the instruments. Think of a, a computer program. Uh, you already know file open or file cut, copy, paste, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, within Siemens, kind of the same idea. You already know that if you take this uh, right-hand button and you enter that button, it's going to take you into a menu structure. And the first thing in that menu structure is going to be a quick start wizard that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And so whether you're looking at a pressure transmitter or a radar or a clamp on flow meter, all of them have that same look and feel. So that was part of the challenge. How can we add that to a legacy product such as the Hydra Ranger Multi Ranger family? Uh, uh, the world we live in is all full of uh, Internet of Things and communication standards abound, uh, be it, you know, foundation field bus or uh, Ethernet or Modbus or uh, Modbus TCP. Uh, how do you how do you add communications to something and make it backwards compatible to make it easy for users in the field? Well, introduce here on the uh, far right hand side. Uh, been around for uh, yeah, a little more than a year now. The uh, uh, Hydra Ranger 200 HMI or Human Machine Interface version. Again, it's got the four buttons and a display. You no longer have to program it with the little handheld uh, programmer. The little uh, uh, infrared remote that uh, about the size of a pack of cigarettes or so. Uh, now you can do all of your diagnostics and all your programming right from the instrument. Um, really, it uh, when you're looking at it, it looks like about the same size box because guess what? It is. Uh, it has the same sonic intelligence that we've been talking about. And when you look under the hood, oops, uh, jumping ahead here, um, I guess I should point out that the Hydra Ranger HMI really has the same basic specifications as your uh, Hydra Rangers that you've maybe had out in the field for uh, a number of years. So when you're looking at range and accuracy, 
uh, and the approvals and certifications exactly the same as it was before. So if you have something in your written spec, you actually don't have to change the spec to make use of the new Hydrange or HMI. When you look under the hood or open the door, uh, one thing you'll notice is everything's finger safe now. That was one of the key differentiators from before. But the other thing that I found really useful is the terminal blocks are now removable. Uh, with me with big fat fingers trying to wire a transducer, uh, I always found that a little difficult to get the wires jammed in there. Now I can pull the terminal block out I can wire the thing out in free space and just plug it right back in again. And that uh, I found that to be very useful. The uh, the power terminals also are removable. So rather than having to go find a breaker or a shutoff on the thing, you can actually pull the power plug out and snap the power plug back in if you want to cycle power in the system for some reason or another. Uh, the other thing is because it's using the same box, is it is something that is very easy to retrofit in the field. If you have an old uh, hydrange or multi-ranger, it's a matter of popping off the door. There's four screws that hold the electronics in. You pull the wiring out, and now you can leave all the plumbing in place, and you can leave the box, uh, uh, the box still mounted to the wall, insert the new electronics in there, bolt it in with the four screws, terminate your wires, uh, slap on the new door, which fits on the same hinges, and you're done. It's a very, very simple upgrade to do in the field. And uh, depending on the complexity of the plumbing, not super uh, complex here, but there have been applications where that is the best, best way to go. Uh, one word of caution, if you do do that, uh, at that uh, after you have done that, the serial number on the board set no longer matches the serial number on the outside of the box. Well, if you're in Arizona and it's been in the Arizona sunshine for a year, you can't read the serial number on the outside anyway. But uh, recognize that if you do the, do the upgrade in the field, the serial number on the box on the outside doesn't match the board set. But if you can live with that, uh, it is a relatively simple uh, upgrade to do in the field. And you don't have to, uh, you know, something you can change out in just a few minutes. Um, really the nice thing about the Hydrange or Multiranger uh, HMI is using those four buttons in display, you don't have to uh, pull out the, the book with the decoder ring to know P001 through P007. Now you can go in, press the right-hand button. You can see there's a quick start application for level, volume, or flow. Uh, from there, you go and start asking a number of questions. Do you What do you want to do? Level, space, distance, and um, it will w walk you through a series of questions. There happens to be for the old uh, Hydra Ranger uh, experts, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the old parameters and the new parameters. So whether you're talking uh, empty distance P006, now it's called empty distance, uh, whereas before you had to, had to know the parameter number. Uh, span P007 is now just called span. So you can uh, read it in English or whatever language you choose. Um, the display itself, uh, is a lot more user-friendly insofar as it'll tell you what type of uh, uh, reading you're doing. Uh, that reading level show you the relays and the status of the relays if enabled. Uh, we'll talk about the digital input in a little bit. Uh, you can have a, a bar graph over here on the side that shows your relative measurement. And if you have a multi-point uh, indication, it'll tell you if you're on point number one or point number two. So the display is a lot more friendly. Uh, here's something uh, I really, really like about the, the new model. If you have ever gone through the process of setting up the relays on the Hydra Ranger, um, I've done it for years. I cannot do it without the book. I, I need to get the decoder ring to know the uh, the mode and, and how, to, how to set up the relays. The relay setup wizard on this thing is a huge improvement. Uh, it basically goes through and says, what kind of, or what relay do you want to set up? Uh, relay number two, uh, what do you want relay number two to do? I want it to be a high alarm or I want it to be a low alarm. At what point do you want the relay to come on? When do you want the relay to go off? Uh, uh, do you want to set up another relay? Yes. Which relay do you want to do? It asks you a number of questions. It is so simple compared to uh, uh, the previous versions using the handheld. Uh, that in and of itself uh, I, I find is uh, very, very uh, useful. The other thing is there's advanced diagnostics on board. That echo profile that we were uh, showing a few minutes ago, you can see the TVT and the echoes of the, uh, you know, what the instrument sees. And you can see that right on the display screen. Uh, it will also tell you a confidence algorithm 
and something very, very helpful, it'll tell you the distance. In this case, 1.881 meters. Uh, and so if you want to do a visual check, in this case, I've got a, you know, at just under two meters, I got a nice big uh, echo off of something, right? And I've got some secondary uh, echoes out here as well. That's something really easy to check. I can pull out a measuring tape and measure down. Yep, about seven feet down, that's where my surface is. Good, it's seeing exactly what I want it to see. That's a real good visual example of uh, diagnostics that are on board. Previously, the only way to get this out of the uh, hydrangea, and it still does work, but you would have to uh, connect up PDM, uh, Process Device Manager software uh, from a laptop in order to get this echo profile. Now it's right on the display screen itself. Uh, we talked a little bit about communications. Uh, we're Siemens, we can't make one of anything. So we have a number of uh, smart links cards, which are communication cards, which snap right into the instrument itself. Uh, it still has, uh, the Hydrangea HMI still has the onboard RS-232 and 485. Uh, that's native to the board itself. But now if you wanna do, for example, ethernet TCP IP, uh, you can do full configuration read and write uh, over Ethernet if you choose. Uh, Modbus TCP IP, not as common, but certainly uh, uh, exists in the industry. Depending on your PLC network, if you want to do Profinet or Profibus or even old device net, uh, there's now a communication module that allows you to uh, program that Hydra Ranger with any uh, uh, with uh, a number of different uh, advanced networks. And so moving, again, moving to that internet of things and the, uh, uh, the future, uh, there are, uh, you know, there is a COM port on it. Uh, if another network comes out, well, we'll just deal with that as it, as it comes. But really we've got the big highlights uh, out there for most PLC networks or uh, PLC slash DCS networks. Uh, jumping off of that real quickly, I'm gonna highlight a uh, recent improvement and a new product called the LU240, which is also brand, brand new. Uh, it, repro uh, it pretty much replaces uh, the Probe LU, which I have pictured up here in the, uh, um, but even though the process connection looks the same, it's just a two inch NPT that screws into the process, uh, and that process connection looks identical to the LU2, uh, the Probe LU that it replaces, there is a huge step change in the the crystal set in the LU240. Uh, it has considerably more power. Uh, marketing tells me it, it's 33% more power. Uh, I can tell you from uh, the field testing I did here in the uh, uh, here in my home office environment, there is a huge difference in the performance set of the uh, crystal. Uh, I had two of these side by side in my office uh, when I was uh, in my uh, uh, media room, which is adjacent to my office, nice smooth uh, uh, sheetrock ceiling. Uh, they both perform very, very well. When I moved into my office, which has the old 70s uh, popcorn ceiling, uh, the Probe LU still picked up the ceiling, but you could actually see the difference uh, in the new crystal set of the LU240 of the, uh, the popcorn ceiling and the interaction of that uh, with the signal. So uh, even though it kind of looks the same where it goes, you know, fits in the same place, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, what I call better, faster, cheaper. Think of your laptop five years ago versus your laptop, uh, uh, your laptop today. Uh, you get much more performance. There is a huge step change in the technology. Uh, there is a huge change in the technology and uh, uh, a much, much higher performance. Uh, this thing really is optimized for uh, small bins. You can put it on, uh, you know, those pallet totes, uh, you know, those plastic uh, bins. I've even seen uh, these guys, the old Probe LU and, and you know, by extension, the, uh, the new LU240, just put on 55 gallon drums of key chemicals that you wanna, uh, that you wanna measure. There is a reduced blanking uh, distance, a little under eight inches. So you can really accommodate those, uh, those short reads. And this thing will still reach out to six and 12 meters. So, you know, you can still get out there, uh, you know, 20 plus feet uh, for the measurement but uh, relatively inexpensive two wire device, doesn't have any relays or any control on it, but it does allow you to measure that level. And something that's significant is you can actually, if you're connected up via heart, you can actually get the process temperature measurement out of the same device. And so it'll tell you the ambient uh, air temperature inside of your uh, uh, process vessel. Sometimes that's important. This is a real inexpensive way to, uh, 
to get uh, a two for get two for one there. Okay, um, but this uh, the Pro Bell U or excuse me the LU 240 or the Pro Bell U 240 uh, was just released uh, in 2019, and so it's part of that that step change in the technology that I was been talking about. Uh, kind of a side by side comparison of the ultrasonic products. Um, the LU four uh, the LUT400 really is optimized for open channel flow applications. So those very, very high accuracy applications. Uh, the Hydra Ranger, Multi Ranger that we've mostly been talking about will do uh, some open channel flow. Not quite as good as LUT, but you know, in some cases it's eh, close enough, right? But it will do uh, uh, multi-channel. So you can do differential. Uh, you can have channel A, channel B, tank one, tank two. Uh, in a high deranger, uh, multi ranger, up to six relays that you can uh, either do control or alarming on. Uh, the LU240, like I said, really is replacing the the probe LU with the exception of applications where you have uh, a Profibus PA communications. Uh, Profibus PA does not come with the LU240 yet, so that would be one application where the older probe LU that does program with a handheld, by the way. Um, and really has a scaled down parameter set of the Hydra Ranger uh, 200, but it programs in the same P001 through P007. So kind of continuing on that, um, the LU uh, T400 does have a data logger and a real time clock. So if you have to do things that are, uh, you know, they're time uh, dependent or you want to log data, um, uh, really if you're doing pump control, uh, the LUT400 will do some of that, but really, again, the, the high deranger is optimized for that application, okay? If you're doing a real low power application, uh, that LU240, so if you got something that's either battery operated or a solar type array, this guy's really low power consumption and would be optimized for that. So again, I'll say it for, I think, the third time, the application is really gonna drive you to where the right, uh, what technology to use. So looking at proper installation, like anything else, give yourself the best chance of success. Uh, usually if we're doing this kind of meeting live, I kind of put this slide up and I say, okay, I have a installation. This happens to be showing radar, but guess what? Ultrasonic looks exactly the same. Um, and I say, I've got four places where I can put uh, my instrument, one, two, three, and four, which is the best, best place to put it. Um, well, typically people will look at number one and say, ah, ladder and obstructions. Okay, number one's not real good. Number four, well, I've got my fill stream. It's not on right now. I've got some tank support bra uh, braces. But if I have an active fill stream, obviously I don't want to put it over here with number four. So that leaves us number two and number three. Um, the most, most correct answer is actually location number two, uh, about a third of the way from the sidewall to the center. Uh, the center, one of the things that can jump up and bite you is if you have a parabolic uh, top or if you have a cylindrical tank laying on its side, uh, some people call it a hot dog tank or you know sausage tank, um, that upper curved surface of the tank can actually create a parabolic reflector and parabolic reflectors have a focal point. And so that can sometimes jump up and bite you, okay? Um, and so in this application, location number two would be the best, best, Number three would be probably the next best choice. Uh, not to worry because you know using auto false echo suppression or some of the advanced tuning, you could perhaps use number one as well if that's the only place that you have a process uh, connection. And a general rule of thumb I use: everybody talks about beam angles and tangent of the angle times the distance, and you know they calculate these cones and the spot size very carefully. Um, even though I, I'm kind of a math geek and I, uh, I uh, you know, love to do those kinds of uh, calculations, generally speaking, I'm using something called the 10 to one rule. And basically what that says is for every 10 feet that, of distance that you wanna measure, you, be, you wanna be about a foot off of the sidewall, okay? So if you're looking down a, uh, a, a wet well or a lift station and you're looking down about 25 feet, you wanna be about two and a half feet or so off of the sidewall and that doesn't really matter if you have a six degree or an eight degree or even a 12 degree beam angle, uh, the math works out about the same. And so that 10 to one rule is really kind of a good rule of thumb for uh, proper placement of either the radar or the ultrasonic type uh, uh, transmitter. So we do have some uh, 
you know, some ways that uh, using algorithms and auto false echo suppression and some of the advanced uh, technologies, if you're kind of stuck with, this is what I got, sometimes we can still optimize the process. But you want to give yourself best chance of success right out of the box, so mounting is, is key in any kind of non-contacting application. Um, a couple of uh, applications specifically for water wastewater is there is something which is called wall cling reduction. Uh, in the uh, old uh, hydrangea multi-rangers that was actually driven by parameter number P136. Uh, today, we don't call it P136, we call it wall cling reduction. Uh, effectively, what this does is it does allow you to, if you have an application, and we see this mostly in uh, wastewater, where the water will come up to a level, let's say 10 feet, turn the pump on, go down to two feet and repeat and it always comes up to 10 feet and goes down and it starts to build up kind of that scum ring uh, right at that upper level. What wall cling reduction allows you to do is you give it a range and I'll say 18 inches okay and so what you say is my high set point is 10 feet and I'll give it a variance of a foot and a half and so what it will do is it will randomize the on set point so it might come on at 8.9 feet and then pump down. And the next time it might go to 8.5 feet and then pump down. The next time it might go to 9.8 feet, okay? And so you give it a range or a band and it will randomize the set point and that has the effect of not always going to exactly the same place and uh, creating a maintenance issue where you have to come in and constantly scrub the sides. And uh, that's really easy to uh, enable. Uh, still exists within the uh, new unit itself, but you don't have to remember the magic decoder ring parameter. You can go drill down through the menu right to wall cling reduction. Uh, you can a contact closure type device, tie it back to the hydrangea. Now this is showing the hydrangea, uh, the older version, uh, works with the new one as well, but you tie it back to a, whoops, you tie it back to a comp, uh, contact closure, and basically what it says is, if I hit this critical high high, do this. And you can define, uh, I want to drive my output to high, high, so or low, low, or some alarm state or something. Uh, if your transducer were to fail or it were to lose its signal for some reason and you reach some critical high point, you now have a, uh, a tie back to it to basically make the controller do something. Open a valve, close a valve, turn a pump on, turn a pump off, uh, whatever you decide to do. That backup level override, very easy to implement and it can be tied right back into the controller itself. Been there for years, often overlooked. So if you have that application with that, with that critical, uh, uh, certainly in the wastewater field, um, you know, hey, I don't wanna have an overflow because I don't wanna have to cl clean up the mess but even more painful than cleaning up the mess, I don't wanna to have to do the paperwork to uh, explain why there was an environmental discharge from the, from the site. So this is a real uh, quick and easy way that you can uh, achieve that. Uh, there is in the AOUT 400 an energy savings function. Uh, we're starting to see it a little bit more in the United States. And basically what it does is it allows you to accommodate for uh, variable energy rates. So I have lower energy rates at night and higher energy rates during peak times during the, during the daylight hours. And what you can do is, uh, in a nutshell, it'll take the uh, uh, pump control, it will change your on and off set points to a higher set point, so it will still protect, uh, uh, protect your tank, but by moving that up, you're actually pumping more often in shorter bursts in order to preserve the system. And then later in the day, when you move to a uh, lower energy time, you can then uh, switch back to the regular set points that you had before and uh, make use of uh, the do the maximum amount of pumping during the times of day that you have the lower energy rates. Okay. Um, so you have all these different technologies, all these different ways to measure. How do you decide? which is best for my application. I'll say it for the probably the last time today, the application picks the technology, not, you know, hey, the new Hydra Ranger HMI is pretty cool, but it doesn't fit everywhere, right? There's times that there are better applications. How do you know what's best? Uh, I have driven it down in my mind to six key questions. And those six key questions you always wanna ask is, number one, what is the material that I'm measuring? Is it a liquid, a slurry, is it a solid? Okay, if it's a solid, 
or even a liquid, what's the dielectric constant of the material? How reflective is it to electromagnetic uh, radiation? Okay, uh, that uh, usually figures into the bulk density of the material as well, but also the material makeup. What's the temperature and pressure ratings? Right, uh, is it in a pressure vessel? If it is, ultrasonic doesn't work because you basically inhibit the movement of the speaker itself. Okay, what about the area classification? General purpose, explosion proof, intrinsically safe. Uh, that'll drive you in a particular direction. Uh, most importantly, what material is the vessel made of? Uh, in Chicago or in the Chicago area, we had uh, one application where uh, we had a radar in a fiberglass tank. And we had an instance where a maintenance person would store his ladder alongside the fiberglass tank, the ladder with aluminum rungs. And uh, whenever the ladder was stored, the instrument didn't work. And you take the ladder away and uh, the instrument worked just fine because it was actually seeing through the side of the vessel or through the side of the tank. And it was actually picking up the aluminum ladder rungs from an object that was outside of the tank. So, uh, what it's made of is, is pretty important. And then lastly, who's my local uh, the Lesman contact? Uh, really, we're here to help, uh, both from a consultant's team. Uh, you'll have my contact information here in a couple slides from now. Uh, if you, You're welcome to reach out to me anytime and send me an email or give me a phone call. And unless you put in the email, do not tell Jim. Uh, I just... Uh, uh, I just uh, copy my response back to Mr. Haldeman and, and tell him what we're working on. Uh, never actually had anybody do that, but uh, you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, Lesman, uh, our host today, you know, they're very knowledgeable. They have uh, application engineers uh, on staff. Uh, uh, Dan Wisey's been around for probably more years than he would even want to admit. And I kind of called Dan uh, on the Lesman staff, Lesman's unfair advantage uh, to have somebody with that level of knowledge and experience uh, in the field. Uh, Dan and I have spent many hours uh, talking uh, bits and bytes on uh, instruments over the years, and uh, you know certainly Lesman has uh, some great resources uh, to reach out, but between or that they can apply to it, uh, you know, and uh, Jim Haldeman would be the uh, one to reach out to uh, any of the uh, uh, 14 application engineers that they have in the field uh, is their field folks. So uh, there's certainly a lot of resources there. But to bear, we bring a lot of resources with Siemens as well. Uh, a little bit about what's new just with instruments. Uh, we do have a new uh, process, which is called Advantage Plus Shipping, which means any instrument that you buy from Siemens, uh, any part or piece uh, that you order, whether it's a 60-inch diameter mag meter or a $1,000 pressure transmitter, uh, the shipping's included. Uh, think Amazon Prime. You know, you order it from Amazon Prime, shipping's always included in, in the price. Same thing with Siemens, but just like Amazon, there's the thing, if you, you need it quicker, click here, enter your, uh, uh, enter your uh, uh, UPS tracking or your UPS billing number and uh, we can ship it faster as well. But during normal service, we do have, uh, 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 we do have uh, uh, shipping, which is included in all of our instruments, regardless of size or weight. Okay, uh, we do have an Advantage Plus stock, which is we do have certain common configurations all built up, ready to go on the shelf. So sometimes, uh, you know, you may need something quick and, uh, you know, if you can uh, live with the common, uh, uh, with the, uh, the uh, common option codes that we have in our Advantage Plus stock, we do have some stuff that we can get to you on, you know, small quantities, but those are really kind of designed to be for it, uh, emergency purposes. Uh, we do have a uh, uh, Advantage Plus support. I mentioned the support of Lesman, the support of our technical uh, uh, consultants uh, on our team, but we also do have a 1-800 number for uh, technical support Monday through Friday, uh, eight to five local time, and that support for uh, current products is free. Okay. And the other changes in our Advantage Plus warranty, all of our instruments right out of the box have a two-year warranty. I uh, was going to point out uh, a little earlier on one of the instruments, you could see the QR code on the side of the instrument. You can walk, walk up with your iPhone or your uh, Android phone using just the camera function. You can uh, look at that QR code. It'll open up a web browser and it'll take you right to the calibration certificates. It'll take you right to the support page for that particular instrument. But it also can tell you what the warranty is. If two years, what if two years isn't enough? 
guess what? We can go to three, four, or five years for just two, four, or six percent of the price. So, uh, you know, two percent of the price adds another year to take it to three years total, uh, four or five. If you want to go over five, let's talk about it. We have a way to do that. So, all that being said, that really kind of brings us to the end and about to the top of the hour here as well. Um, I am uh, willing to stay on as long as uh, we have questions uh, uh, questions that come up. Hopefully, uh, people are still there. I haven't either A, bored them to death, or uh, B, been talking to Dead Air because uh, the uh, the network dropped out 37 minutes ago, and I didn't know it, and I've been talking uh, talking to nothing. So, uh, Jim, please please tell me that you're all still there. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. There's still uh, quite a few people on board, so I appreciate the, the presentation. You 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 phased out a few times for about 10 seconds, and then you oh, came no. back in. So, but that's okay. I'm not sure what caused that. Um, but e it is everybody's it is. at home on the internet uh, downloading movies right now on Netflix. I think is. Uh... I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> so what yeah. I'm going to do? What I'm going to? We had one okay. question uh, that Jeffrey said to me specifically about one application. So I responded to you, Jeff, asking you to give me a call after the webinar. We'll just discuss your specific application um, uh, privately, uh, just because it's really a specific application. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone here as soon as I can find the right button. And if anyone would have any questions, let me just get there. Everyone should be able to, to speak if they have any questions. So if anyone has any questions. And you can either type them in or be bold and, yeah. and yell it out. Well, uh, I said that, uh, yes, I said that in our case, we have a six meter height water tank that is located on the ground. And we want to use bubbler system using data P transmitter. Could radar, radar, could radar, uh, radar or other uh, technology be best for us? This water are uh, used for uh, safety purpose. Thank you. Okay. You the whole so, yeah, so you have a okay. underground tank that has a height of about six meters and you have yeah. a you have an old bubbler system and using a pressure transmitter for that. Um, you know, bubbler systems have been around for a long time and they certainly work really well. Um, but uh, depending on the dimensions of the tank and uh, are the, if there's any obstructions uh, or if it's just a, a wide open tank, both ultrasonic and radar could work in that application. Really what we would uh, uh, probably start to look at next is what is the process connection? What uh, you know what what do we have for access uh on the tank itself and uh uh from there that process connection um you know if we have a uh, uh for example if we have a two inch npt uh certainly that lu240 would uh, reach out to that six meter uh, distance uh quite nicely uh there's also a 12 meter version of that if uh if we're uh even a little over the six meters uh that would be a real uh, relatively inexpensive two-wire loop power device uh, that would give you 4 to 20 milliamp uh, output to the relative level if you don't have to do any control. Uh, certainly, uh, there are radar options for that as well. Um, again, really, it's kind of going to be driven by the the dimensions of the tank and the uh, and the process connection that we have to work with. Uh, but probably uh, ultrasonic would be the uh, the lesser expensive option that you could use. Uh, that would give you uh, pretty good performance results, uh, Jim. If you can maybe uh, uh, capture, uh, uh, you know, capture the uh, the data of who asked the question, and you know, we can get a little more specifics about the tank. But if the bubbler system uh, is in place and working, and you just need to replace the pressure transmitter portion of that, uh, that's an option as well. Thank Hold you, on. Mark. Yes. I'm sorry, Lala, did you have additional comments? No, no, thank you. Many thanks for you. Thank you. Okay, well then I think that um, that seems to be the questions that we have today. Again, if you have any additional questions that come to mind, please feel free to contact Mark Lee or myself, Jim Haldeman at Lessman Instrument Company. And I'll be happy to answer any questions or work with you on determining which instrument might be the best solution for your specific application. So with that being said, thanks again, Mark. 
I'm going to end the conference shortly. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks for attending and thanks for, for uh, uh, you know, thanks for staying with us. Uh, I know it's a little hard on the other end with, uh, uh, you know, in uh, when you can't see it live, but uh, hopefully we kept your attention here for the for the full hour. So thanks. Thanks for attending.